Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here with Dadvice TV, and this is Dadvice TV Live. All right, guys. Wow, we've already got people posting in the comments. We'd love to see where you are from. And with me, as always, it's Tuesday. So we have Jen. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Hey, James. I am doing great. How are you? Hey, doing fantastic. Now, here in Ohio, we have had so much rain the last few days. Mm. How is it over there in Hawaii? Well, we've it's been getting warmer, which is good. Kind of makes me have to get out on our walks earlier or later in the day. But you know what? I'm not going to complain. It's not it, rain is spotty here. It's always very spotty, so it'll come through and it'll be a downpour for a few minutes, and then it goes away. You just can't predict when that's going to happen. So, um, but yeah, I'm I'm still enjoying it. Going to make the most of it. <laughs> Yep, I cannot wait for the rain to stop. We got about two more days of it. Then I can get back out there, get my steps in outside. Right now, I'm trying to get them around mm -hmm. the house and um, just when I go out to the yard to check the mail and stuff like that in between the rains, but really looking forward to it. All right, we've got lots of people here. So uh, a quick little, some housekeeping real quick, guys. Let me know. If you have any troubles hearing, Jen or I, so I can adjust the volumes on my side. I've kind of rearranged some of the settings here and the setup and some new stuff to make it uh, hopefully sound better and keep our audio sounding great. And I wanted to also do a quick little shout out. Um, hey, Ray, glad to see you back. That is awesome. Ray's calling in or joining us from London. Hey there, he's wow. probably got some rain. <laughs> Also, I hope to see, it looks like we got Candy and Jody. It looks like you guys are here. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for all of your support online. Now, if you guys have not yet joined the Facebook group, Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook, make sure, yes, and do <laughs> it. Jen has all sorts of great information in there, and it was just a few days ago, Jen, you were cooking up... Um, uh, for it was, it looked like, um, pulled pork. Um, uh, you used, uh, what's that plant called? It comes in a can. It's expensive, but it comes in a can. What was it you made? Jackfruit. Jackfruit. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard of it. Never tried it. That looked incredible. So I have it on my list. Apparently my local Walmart has it in the can so I can get some there and I can try to make that. But I love recipes and all of you out there, we all know it can get a little boring if you're you're always going to the same go-to recipes. It's great to expand what you can use to add some variety or even pick up little tips like how can I change the texture or change the flavor? And uh, Jen's Facebook group is a great place to not just see recipes, but she's cooking it. You see her in her kitchen, making it, <laughs> learning how to do it. Now, now, speaking of eating, that's kind of why we're here today, everybody. We're going to talk about a very popular and kind of confusing diet that's out there, the keto diet. Um, as a matter of fact, my wife keeps calling it the... Uh, uh, what Cato diet, as in Cato oh. from back in the 90s. <laughs> and most of you probably know, for a while, I was on a very strict keto diet. And it, it did help me lose weight, but I couldn't just jump right on it because there's a lot of things you got to be concerned about with kidney disease. And we're going to get into those. I don't want to jump ahead. But let's go ahead, Jen, and let's first talk about what exactly is a keto diet because there are so if i asked 20 different people i would probably have almost 20 different answers on what a keto diet is so what is it well a ketogenic diet is essentially a version of a very low carbohydrate diet but instead of focusing on protein which some people think of traditionally more like in the 90s about the low carb diet a keto diet is very high in fats. So the typical range for a ketogenic diet is about 70 to 80% comes from fats. 
about 10 to 20% comes from protein and only five to 10% comes from carbohydrates. And these are any kind of carbohydrates, healthy, unhealthy, sugars, fruit, whole grains, all of that is included in that five to 10% of carbohydrates. When ketogenic diets first came out, they were used medically to help people with epilepsy to prevent seizures. And now this is still used to prevent epilepsy or control epilepsy, but there are some suggestions that it may not even work all the time for that either. So it's always a case by case basis, but that is essentially how the ketogenic diet first came out was a medically prescribed and very, very strict follow diet. This is something that people would follow in the hospitals, in clinics that are very like you're, you're in a bubble. You're very, very controlled and regulated about exactly how much you eat. There's a dietitian following every percent, every grade every milligram, very, very tracked diet. Now the ketogenic diet is coming out as a much more commercialized type of fad diet. However, that's when things kind of start to get a little blurry in the concept of what it exactly is. And people do start thinking that it's a little bit more protein and not necessarily the fats, or they think about fats in all different kinds of ranges and all different kinds of fats. And we know that there are healthy fats and there are unhealthy fats. And that's sometimes where the issue comes up of exactly when people are trying to follow a keto diet, what this means and what they end up putting in their bodies. So uh, the other thing too is a true ketogenic diet needs to be followed strict. So anyone who's following a ketogenic diet and goes on a cheat day there's no such thing as a cheat day on a ketogenic diet. Exactly. It takes you out of the keto process. And it takes so long to get back in to there. We are, you're, you're creating the ketones. And there was a point where when I did it, I had to modify it and I was knocked out of ketosis for probably like a week to get back into it. And mm-hmm. that was just all lost time um, in my goal of, trying to reduce my weight, get that BMI a little bit lower. Yeah, so the ketogenic diet now, people are using it very often for weight loss, which some studies do suggest that it can help. And like you, James, you said that that was part of your process of your weight loss. So there is a possibility of weight loss. What we don't quite know yet are the long-term effects of the ketogenic diet. We don't know what that means for our health come 50, 60 years. And and when we talk about following a diet like this, it's very often, uh, it's supposed to be a life a lifelong change. And it's not something that you do for a couple weeks, a couple months, and then just stop doing it and expect uh, your weight to stay the same, for that weight loss to continue. So it's, again, a lifelong process. And we just don't know what that means down the road. If you continue this for years and years, what that's going to do to your health. Yeah, so I did it for, oh, probably really strict, maybe three months. And my doctor made me wait. I wanted to do it right away because I thought, oh, my goodness, if I could just lose weight, that will help my kidneys. And, you know, I, what can I do to lose weight the fastest? You know, I'm always like a numbers guy. How can we get there really quick? And he made me wait until my GFR was 30 before I could even try it. And I remember thinking like, oh, I'm getting closer, getting closer. And I was so excited to try it. And my doctor told me, now, when you do this, we're going to have to keep tweaking it. And your GFR is probably going to go down. And that is exactly what I saw. We kept tweaking it. It was really hard for me to find those good fats, like you mentioned, Mm -hmm. and to keep the right balance and get all the nutrients I needed, Um, especially since couldn't be eating apples my probably my go-to snack was apples because there's so many varieties and different flavors i loved eating apples but one apple is your day's worth of carbs on a keto diet and i did lose weight which was great and then i switched to a um a low carb diet no longer doing the, the the strict keto and i can i'll be honest with you guys my weight, I'm still, I still weigh less than before I started keto, but not as less. <laughs> My weight has started to creep up some. Um, so I just gotta, I'm gonna not go back fully on keto. My, my, my goal is I'm just gonna exercise more, be more active, 
Weather's getting nicer. Summer's here. Get out hiking, walking, taking the kids out and stuff like that. That's going to be my goal. Um, for me, I definitely knew I couldn't stick on a strict keto for the rest of my life or mm -hmm. even going six months. It, it, you know, People think, oh, it's got to be so hard to be on a renal diet when you're a kidney patient. But when you know to look at nutrients, a renal diet becomes really easy. It was hard to be on a keto diet for me. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely couldn't have done it long term. So it, it definitely is a lifestyle. It's a, it's a choice to make. And uh, for me, it worked for a little while, but I, I just couldn't keep up with it. Yeah. And that's a great point, too, that you bring up, James. I mean, when we talk about a renal diet, there's already so many things that we're focusing on. We're focusing on sodium. We're focusing on potassium, phosphorus, protein. Some of those things need to be restricted anyway. Oftentimes, almost everybody has to be mindful of their sodium. Potassium, it really depends. Phosphorus, it also depends. But protein also, we, we need to look at making sure we're not eating too much. So why would we want to add yet another restriction on top of all those other things that we're focusing on? Exactly. That's what, that was actually the question I asked myself. I'm like, it was hard enough to get the renal diet down. Why am I doing this to myself, making yeah. it so much more difficult? And the a renal diet, as, as we've discussed, really isn't that restrictive. It's mm -hmm. really about portion control, knowing what I'm watching and making good choices. A keto diet is not that. It is restrictive. It's yes. saying no, boom, gone. Yes, exactly. And it really limits what you can choose. And when it came to getting my protein, um, you just can't grab any nut. You now that's what they say. Mm -hmm. Grab nuts. They all work. Mm -hmm. Well, no, mm -hmm. I had to watch my nuts because I'm watching my potassium. I'm watching all these other things and salt, you know, sodium. So many of the, the nuts that I would find, like, oh, let me grab a pack of, of nuts to, to snack on. They're loaded with salt. It's like, oh, it, it just added too many restrictions, true real restrictions for me. Yeah, absolutely. And and oftentimes when, when you do look up information for the ketogenic diet online, they, they'll say things like eat uh, more avocados. Okay, well, what if you have kidney issues and you need to be careful with potassium because avocados are loaded in potassium. Mm -hmm. And James, like you said, the nuts. Could be high in salt, could be high in phosphorus, could be high in potassium. Okay, what about heavy whipping cream? Because you can have that as part of your diet. Well, for one, it's dairy, so it's going to be higher in potassium and phosphorus. It has a lot of saturated fat, which is not good for our cardiovascular system, not good for our blood pressure and our heart health. So a lot of these things are already just instinctively, they don't sound right when we talk about kidney health. Maybe for other people, that could be something that they could do. But in this case, it, it just creates, from my experience, more anxiety for people when it comes to figuring out what to eat. And again, it's just crossing off, can't have this, can't have this, mm -hmm. can't have this. Like, okay, well, at the end of the day, what can you have? Exactly. And talk, yeah, and that's where we talk about like the risk of more of those nutritional deficiencies because you're restricting so many things. You know, James is saying not giving up apples and not being able to have that, you know, very limited vegetables. Everything is so limited. You're essentially taking a piece of paper and just poking holes into it and expecting be, to be able to use it later. It's you're creating all these gaps in your nutritional status that it can be damaging in the long run. And then we think, oh, maybe a multivitamin. That'll really help. Not necessarily because it's a certain balance and there could be nutri there could be nutrients that you need from food that the multivitamin just isn't going to account for. So even though we try to plug up a few of those holes with a vitamin, it just might not be the right amount. And then who wants to take a pill over eating good food? I mean, James, exactly. would you rather take a pill instead of having an apple? No, 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 no. So I, I try to minimize the pills. I take what my doctor prescribes, as prescribed all the time for my blood pressure, um, I, you know, I take a few other ones we talk about often, Renadil, Pro Renal Plus D. I don't want anything else. I, and I enjoy eating. Come on. I, you know, even apples are just, it's great eating them. The, you know, the, the difference between them, the, the, I love the crisp ones, um, uh, the really juicy ones, things like that. Um, 
Well, I got to go buy some apples. I, I'm actually out of them this morning. My son told me we have no more apples. I ate the last oh, no. of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> tomorrow I'm getting some more apples. But I would much rather enjoy that uh, than pop a pill. Yeah. And, you know, as we talked about last week when we, we talked about supplements, some of these pills, you got to, you know, what really is in there? You got to make sure you pick the right ones that a third party has validated. Yeah, that is what's in there. And mm -hmm. some of these may have things that are not good for our kidneys. And, oh, we don't want to go there. Yeah, so eating exactly. is by far the best way, in my opinion. Yeah. And I mean, I know I'm putting a lot of negativity on the keto diet when we're talking about kidney disease, but I do want to be really clear that even though I'm saying no to the traditional keto diet, and that's the 70, 80% fats, uh, 10 to 20% protein, 5 to 10% carbohydrates, even though I'm saying that might not be the best, it doesn't mean that you can't do a lower carbohydrate diet diet and and have a little bit more fats. It, it really is uh, the ratio is different when we talk about kidney health. And James, just like you said, you're still following kind of a lower carbohydrate mm -hmm. diet. Totally fine. That works for you, and that's great. Um, you know, you notice that weight change coming up after the keto because again, your body's just compensating. It lost yep. a lot of weight. It freaked out, and it's going to put it back on because it's scared and it feels like this isn't safe. I need to hold on to this weight because I, I don't know what's happening now. I'm, I'm kind of scared by all these changes of the food and being restricted. So I'm going to hold on to things. Yeah. And I, and personally, as far as my emotions go and the pleasure I get out of eating food and having a meal and, and making it, I am so much happier on a low carb diet than the strict super duper keto diet. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of fun making food and I used to never do that. But now when I'm making it, I'm saying, oh, let me throw in some gingers, do this, do that. And when it, you know, slice up some apples, throw that in my mm -hmm. stir fry, gives me a little crunch here and there. I like that. Yeah. But when I, when I was on the keto diet, while it did work for my weight loss, it helped me a lot there. Um, it, it was so restrictive and mm -hmm. a lot of the meals, I just felt like, oh, it's time to eat. Yeah, <sighs> that's the worst. I hate that. We don't want to sit down to a meal and feel bummed out about our food. We don't want to be thinking this is going to be my life forever. I mean, right. do you want to pass up a piece of birthday cake? Are you going to say no to a piece of bread with your dinner when you go out to eat? I mean, is that how you want to live your life? That's just <laughs> or a not donut. Mm, I mean, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So if you want to, if you want to be able to eat and enjoy your foods and not feel that like oppression of such a severely restrictive diet, there is such a better way to do it. And it's finding that gray area. I mean, we as humans are so black and white, all or none, yes or no, but we need to start working in that gray area of where we can fit more things in and realize that we can still benefit and we can still get something out of it and enjoy it more. So that's the best part to me. Oh yeah, definitely. So, um, when it comes to having kidney disease and people who do want to do a keto diet or a low carb diet, what are the tips and recommendations you have? Okay. So what I would recommend is do not restrict your carbohydrates to that five to 10% because that again, just like James said, if you had an apple, that would be it for the day. So restricting too much is not going to be helpful. You can be careful with your portions when it comes to your carbohydrates in your diet. And oftentimes I talk with clients, I talk with people about the best portion sizes for their meals. So if you've ever used, um, have you guys heard of like using your hand to measure portions? Go ahead and explain it to everyone just in case. I have. Okay. Um, okay. well, much much better to use the hand than using a, the deck of cards reference. Like I don't always have a deck of cards, oh, right, and I'll right. and I'll tell you when I remember a deck of cards, it always seems to get bigger <laughs> than what they really are. The hand is much easier. Yes. So for those of you that don't know, you can spot check your portions in your meal by using your hand. So for example, when we talk about carbohydrates, if you go for about a fist, a fist worth that's going to be a good amount for you. 
If you go more than that, it might be a little too much carbohydrates going less than that. It really depends, but this is a good ballpark for this point. And this is about a cup or so, depending on your size. For the proteins, we're looking at about the palm size. So this is what James was saying, a deck of cards. So your protein should be this amount or even less, depending on your kidney issues. We really don't need more than this. If it's something light, like a piece of fish, you could do the full hand size because it is already a lighter thing, right? Fish is lighter than say chicken or beef or something if you're eating animal proteins. And then the great thing is when you're having vegetables that you can do two fists worth. So this is where you can get a lot more bang for your buck. You get mm -hmm. a lot more nutrition. And I mean, imagine sitting down to a plate that has two fists worth of vegetables, has a fist of carbohydrates and has a palm of protein. I mean, that's a really filling plate and that's going to fill you up and keep you satisfied, but still keeping those portions in check. Yep. Definitely very easy to go about that. And, and, um, you know, great for when you're dining out because then anything that's extra, mm -hmm. just get that in the to-go box uh, and take it home later for a different meal. Absolutely. When we talk about the portion sizes going out to eat, I mean, we are always looking for the most bang for our buck. So we're going to be sad if we get a small plate when we go out to eat because we're paying a lot of money for that situation. So instead of thinking that you need to eat all of it because you paid for it and this is your money's worth, think of it as I'm paying for two or three meals in this mm -hmm. situation. If you get a big bowl of pasta, it's not necessarily intended for one sitting, especially if you're going to stick to a fist amount. So let's say you look at your plate and you see that it's okay, maybe it's three fists. You know that that accounts for three different meals. And again, get that to-go box and put put two thirds or half of it aside. Make sure you get that two serving the two fists of vegetables as well, because that's going to also help fill you up without having you feel more deprived. So again, you can focus on the lower, the right amount of carbohydrates, but you don't need to go so severe as a keto, because again, that's just going to be more restrictions, and you're going to feel a lot more upset and guilty about anything that you're eating outside of those parameters. Yep. And meals should be enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. That's, that's such a big part of our life. Meals and food are culturally relevant. They're important parts of our family connections. I mean, food is always around when it comes to celebrations, when it comes to comfort, when we're sick. There's certain foods that we gravitate towards to feel better. I mean, food is always going to be there. So for us to be saying we can't eat any of those things anymore because of this keto idea. Yeah, that's just sad. That's depressing. It makes yeah. me sad as a dietitian. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to hear that. Um, the variety and the not restricting yourselves. Um, I have a question here, which is kind of related to this. Argyle asked, is plant-based protein better or safer for kidneys than animal-based protein? So when we're we're sitting here and we're doing up our stuff. What are some recommended protein sources um, that, that come to mind for a kidney patient? And I have well, a feeling they're going to be plant-based because <laughs> cause of <yeah>. this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I work with my clients in promoting a lot more plant-based sources. Oftentimes, we actually start 100% plant-based. And then we do that for a while and then see if we can reincorporate animal proteins if they want. Oftentimes I find that my clients actually feel better doing a plant-based diet and not having animal proteins that they don't even want to go back to eating animal proteins. So plant-based proteins are great for the kidneys in that they have oftentimes, most often, they have much less saturated fat and they have things like fiber, they have other vitamins and nutrients in them. So it's actually giving you more rather than uh, restricting or causing issues with other additives or things that you could find in animal meats that aren't necessarily in plant proteins. So plant proteins could be things like tofu, soy, like edamame, uh, tempeh. It could also be beans or lentils. I mean, and, and we start talking about that category and there's so many. And I know right away people say, well, what about the phosphorus? What about the potassium? Well, the good news 
is that the phosphorus is not absorbed as much. Yeah, because it's plant-based. Exactly. Yeah. So that's a great thing about it is that it's not as impactful as the phosphorus in fast food, in the additives, things that you find in packaged foods. So that's not really a concern. Potassium can be something to pay attention to, even with plant-based, but that's really going to be case to case. It's going to depend on your labs and your kidney health to determine what needs to be controlled in that regard. So uh, plant proteins are, I think, phenomenal. Even grains like quinoa, brown rice, farro. I mean, these have proteins in them as well. So by following a plant-based diet, we are by no means going to have any issues getting protein. Yep. And then Argyle asked, is fish better than red meat? I do think fish is better than red meat. Uh, fish has the health, the heart healthy fats. So if you do want to keep animal proteins in your diet, then I think having fish instead of red meat is better. Uh, red meat can be linked to some more cardiovascular issues uh, because of the saturated fat content. And even things like sodium can be impacted with that. So I, I do err on the caution of red meat, and that's usually the first thing I say, okay, if you if you can't get rid of all the meat, um, even though I tell I always tell my clients, when you hire me, you're hiring me to protect your kidneys, so I'm on the lookout for that, but if you really, really are against a uh, fully plant-based, at least cut out the red meat, at least do that and see what that can do for you, because that in itself is a huge success if you can get rid of that extra saturated fat and heavy protein from the diet. Very good. And one point I want to make, um, you had mentioned soy. And a lot of people, I they hear, they've heard me talk about how I avoid soy. And I want to make a point here about that. The only reason I avoid soy, now soy for most people is an anti-inflammatory. So you can eat it and it doesn't cause inflammation. I'm one of those few people here on earth that soy causes inflammation. So when I was diagnosed, you know, I'm always looking at my labs, trying to figure out what to do. And I was leaking a lot of protein. And my doctor's like, well, you, you probably still have some inflammation of your kidneys. And we're looking and trying to figure out what is it? And he said, Are you, do you have any allergies to soy? Just, just do you know if you do? I said, no, I eat soy all the time. Edamame, a tofu, I love soy. He says, let's cut it out for a little bit and see what happens. Turns out, you know, I don't have like hives or anything like that, but it does cause some inflammation within my body. So I personally um, greatly limit soy. So people on here may have watched some of my old videos and they'll hear me say, oh, I like this because it's not soy based. Soy is not bad. It's mm -hmm. just I, and I never, I never, I, I didn't realize I forgot to tell people this um, whenever I would say that. I have an allergy to soy, and that is why I personally limit it. I don't avoid it, but I limit it. I don't see any other problems when I eat soy, except that when my GFR was lower, it would increase my protein leakage. And I wanted yeah. that down below 20, and I got it to zero. I don't have any protein leaking out, which is fantastic for me. Um, another question on here, Darlene is asking, and this is one that I love, can we do intermittent fasting? Um, I'm going to give my opinion on that, then we'll get your um, thoughts and advice on it as a, a real dietitian. So I do intermittent fasting every single day. Now, I did try one meal a day, OMAD, for 30 days. And boy, you talk about keto being hard. That was even harder, trying to get all the nutrients I need in one hour. And I was traveling a lot with work. So that was really, really hard to do. And so I went back to just intermittent fasting. I eat my first meal at noon, maybe 1130 at the earliest. You know, I get up, I'm busy getting ready for work. I'm logging into work. I'm doing things. Time's flying. I'm drinking water all day long it's got some lemon in it gives me some flavor i'm not really hungry until closer to noon i eat my first meal i might have a few little snacks and then i have my very last bite to eat it ends by 6 p.m at night now that's good for me because then i got to focus on getting the kids ready for bed and chores around the house and stuff 
And then I'm going to bed at night and I'm sleeping and I'm not eating while I'm sleeping. Um, and, and I do that every single day. And I find that is it works with my lifestyle. Um, I, I don't do it on purpose. It's not like I'm sitting there going like, oh, gosh, I'm hungry. Come on, hurry up, get to my window when I can eat. I just have gotten used to it where I only eat during that short period of the day. I have usually two meals, you know, my first meal and my last meal. I guess you could consider it lunch and dinner. And I might have some snacks in between, some apples and things like that. Um, but I, I like it because it's just comfortable. It's easy for me and it fits my lifestyle. It's something that I could do the rest of my life. There's no effort for me. So what, what are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? Well, I do have a bit more of a positive mindset when it comes to intermittent, intermittent fasting for kidney issues compared to keto. The thing about intermittent fasting is that it doesn't have those hard and fast rules that the keto diet does. So if you fast one day and then you don't fast the next day, it's not going to change anything in the long run. It's, it's not going to do that as a genetic diet. So I think that it, just like James said, it really depends on the individual and on your lifestyle, finding something that really makes sense and fits with your day-to-day -day routine is going to be the best bet. We typically should be fasting already for that eight to 10 hours while we're sleeping, waking up, resting. So theoretically, technically, you should already be fasting anyway with just your un uninterrupted sleep time and not eating probably first thing right when you wake up and not eating right before you go to bed. So some people I do recommend uh, if, if they're doing the midnight snacks and midnight eating to look at stopping that because that's probably not the best options, not the best food choices, and your body might not need it at that point. So it can depend, but it doesn't need to be a very, very severe restrictive time because on the other hand, if you are fasting for too long or if you give yourself too small of a window to eat everything, what it can do is cause strain on the kidneys because you're overloading it with such a big Thanksgiving style meal at one point in time. And that's a lot for the body to digest at one setting. I mean, if you imagine eating a Thanksgiving dinner every single day, that can get really draining and our that's energy what, levels. That's what one meal a day was. And oh, that was tough. That was, yeah. and my doctor told me not to do it, but I thought yeah. I'm going to try it. <laughs> I, it just goes back to that whole concept of, is this enjoyable? Like maybe I might, I might think this is great for a few days or something, but then eventually it's going to get old. And another thing too, these dietary changes that you make, even fasting, if this is interrupting a big part of your social life, a healthy social life, if people want to go have dinner with you and they aren't going to go out until seven o'clock or something, are you going to say no to your friends to go out and socialize because of this diet? I mean, that, that, that's, we need a social life. And I think that it's really important for us to have and to do it in a healthy way. So if you find yourself saying no to social events, turning turning down parties and get togethers and celebrations because it doesn't fit in your window, then that is something to be thinking about for yourself, for your own mental health, because that can make a really big difference in the long run too. Yeah. And that's a really good point when it comes to a strict ketogenic diet. You are saying no, and you mm -hmm. are going out. You know, I would go out with coworkers. We travel, traveled a lot, and we're done with a long day. We're all going out to dinner together. And when I was on my strict ketogenic diet, I was like, okay, well, it needs to fit my kidneys and my extremely low carb count. Mm -hmm. What's available? And I ended up saying no, 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 going back to the hotel. Um, and I'd always got one with a little kitchenette and then making my own food. Now, of course, the day's late. I'm tired. I, I didn't get to enjoy going out as much mm -hmm. where intermittent fasting, if if one day I eat a later meal, I go out, we do something, no problem. I'm not thrown mm -hmm. off track. I'm just, yeah, I eat a meal later that day. Didn't hurt me. The next day I can go back to my, my 12 to six or if it's 12 to seven, whatever it is, I found intermittent fasting very flexible. So it did fit my life, which is one of the things I like. Also, um, 
my doctor, I had never thought about intermittent fasting. He recommended that to me in the beginning when my GFR was really low. How can I reduce some of the burden on my kidneys? Mm -hmm. And he had recommended, well, let's start. And it was a bigger window. I don't want you to eat until 9 a.m. And I want you to stop at 9 Mm p.m. And, you know, I was was severely obese. I had a a huge BMI. Uh, Don't want to say what it is because it was... Oh, I, I just didn't like that I got there, but he started with a wide window. And then as I got used to that, we, he shrank, shrunk it a little bit, but then I kept shrinking it to where it's like, Hey, this, and it just happened naturally for me. Mm-hmm. It got to where it was much lower, but I found that going with the intermittent fasting helped me with my lower GFR, um, not get too much food all day long, going into my digestive system, not, yeah, I used to get up at night, you know, like, oh, got to go to the restroom. I'm going to have a snack. I don't, why in the world did I do that? I don't know. Um, my waistline just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because of it. And that helped me break that bad habit. Yeah, I have a, one of my clients right now is, is practicing intermittent fasting. But what we found when she was first starting it, when we were working together is she had a cutoff time of 6 p.m. And it made it really hard for her to enjoy her dinner when her work was getting busy. And that was really the time that things got picked up. And so she found that she would end up eating really fast, eating poor choices, Mm. or uh, skipping it entirely and losing out on some good nutrition. So we've talked about just shifting her time that she is eating just by an hour to give her a little bit more freedom, a little bit more leeway to be able to have food and not feel um, that added level of stress. I mean, she was already having stress with work picking up and things getting busier. I don't want to add more stress with a diet restriction. And again, it's, this can be any kind of window that you want. If you experience heartburn and if you're having issues with heartburn all the time, you might benefit in having a cutoff time in the evening a couple hours before bed so that you're not getting that reflux after dinner when you're trying to lay down and go to sleep. That can often happen. If you are not a breakfast person uh, first thing in the morning, that's okay. You don't have to be. But again, you want to think about your day. I think about how to get enough nutrition because mm-hmm. our nutrition is our fuel. And, you know, whatever kind of diet practice that you're practicing, you're deciding what you're going to fuel your body with and what you're going to be giving to your kidneys also to be processing. So this is all really, really important things. And it's a personal choice. I mean, you know, James has his perspective and his preference and what works for him and you will have your preference and what works best for you. And that's what really matters is that it's best for you. Yeah. I always, people always ask me, geez, what's the best diet? And I say the best one is the one that you can stick to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Any diet can be modified, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's all about portion control. Let's, let's modify it so that it fits your lifestyle and you can stick to it because a diet that you can't stick to, it's worthless. You're yeah. Gonna, it's a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah. And you're cheating all the time. You're not on the diet. Yeah. Okay. And then let's just, I'm going to do a really quick tangent on that. Uh-huh. And I've asked my clients about this too. When people say they're cheating on a diet, you're not cheating on a diet. Who are you cheating on? That's a good question. I mean, it, it's only, it's a deal between you and your health. So yep. you're cheating on yourself. You're cheating on your health. So if that's the case, and if you're finding this diet and you're saying, oh, I'll just cheat this one time, or I'll just have a cheat day, or I'll have a cheat meal, you're cheating on yourself. You're cheating on your health. You've not quite yet found what works for you. And yep. you got to get to the root problem. You've got to get to what am I trying to fix and get that professional help. You know, I, I, James, you and I are both, I'm very biased because I am a dietitian and you have your experience with dietitians, but we are here to help coach you and to help you figure that out using all of your medical history, your labs, your medications, your issues, your goals. We use all of that to help you figure out what works best for you so that you can take that burden off of yourself and you have somebody there to help guide you in that right direction. Yep. And dietitians, yo, I've had... I've had, I had one negative one, but it really wasn't their fault. It was in the hospital. They, you know, pretty much are on their way to my room. They have 10 minutes. I'm laying in a bed with all the stuff hooked up and 
They've got to give me advice. They don't have time to talk to me or learn about me. Um, that was my bad experience. After that, every dietitian I've worked with a lot of them, um, not because I fire them. It's only because it's like, oh, there's another one who's starting here. Can I go see them? Can I have an hour of their time? Can I do a, an initial consultation, get some ideas from them and talk to them? I now I'm a sponge and I'm always looking mm -hmm. for more tips and tricks and what are they doing? Do they, you know, they, they've seen so much. I've only seen my stuff. I got my, my blinders on. I only see what I've experienced. So I'm always looking to, to learn more for them. And I find the dietitians to be a huge wealth of information. Um, and, and for those that are, that are new here to, to, to dad vice TV, you know, I've, my initial GFR was an eight. I got up to a 13 today. My last labs, it's been a long time because of COVID-19. My last labs were a GFR 33, but I have zero symptoms. And all of this, every bit of this was from diet and lifestyle changes. No magic pills, no Mayan moon dance, nothing, nothing like that. None of those things you see advertised on the internet that say cure, flush, restore, none of that stuff. Just looking at nutrition, working with dietitians, working with my di my doctors and making lifestyle changes. And the lifestyle changes were just things like, what's damaging my kidneys that I'm doing? Stop doing it. You know, I, I never did smoke, but if I was a smoker, I would have cut that in instantly. I drank a lot of soda, the sugar, the chemicals, boom. Never again. Stopped it right away because my future me, that's who you're cheating, future you. Yeah. Um, my future you, I owe it to him to be healthy, to have my energy back. And as people mentioned in the comments, they said, oh, James, you're looking really good. Uh, when you look at my original videos, any of you that are brand new, oh, my goodness, my energy level, my my slow, how slow I spoke. Uh just my sunken in dark eyes. Oh, <laughs> you know, I've come so far, but it's all because of the information. Like what we're talking about, really working with the doctors, looking at nutrition, breaking it down. Um, I used keto for a little bit for a reason to drop weight, to get my BMI lower. Um, and, and the reason my doctor wanted me to lose weight, first of all, it's healthy, but he said, just in case you need a transplant, you need to lose weight. You don't want to need a transplant and then be told, hey, now we got to wait for you. Come on, lose the weight now. It's healthier for you. Um, and I wanted to do everything I could to improve my health. And if losing weight was part of it, boom, I'm going to get it done. Add it to my to-do list. Yeah, that's great. I mean, James, your story is so inspiring for so many people. And I even talk with my clients who follow you and they said, yeah, I remember him from way back when. And I remember just his eyes, everything just yes. grayed out. And, and they're saying now he looks so good and has so much energy. And I feel like we spend our sessions talking about how we're both so excited to know you, and to be, <laughs> you know, part of uh, dad vice TV hey, world. If it helps inspire them to, 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 take your advice and to implement it and to stick to it. Woohoo! Yeah. When I, when I look back and I see those videos, I'm like, Oh, I just so want to click the delete button. I look awful, but I'm like, no, no, no. I need to keep those there. So people can see this really does work. Yeah. Go look at me. Listen to me. How slow I spoke, uh, my low energy level. And, and, and let me tell you guys, I was faking it for the camera back then. I'm like, I was like, I gotta, I gotta get my energy up. Right. And, and as soon as I was done, I was like, oh, it's over. Yeah. Thank goodness. You know, I had severe anemia from not eating the right things. I was missing my, my, my iron was low, uh, you know, other things. Um, well, shoo. Uh, now a lot of people also are asking, is this live? Yes, this is live. Here, here's, 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 here's I can, I can prove it. It's six forty four p.m. If you can see, I've got a weather alert <laughs> for the rain. How do I clear oh, all weather alerts? But anyway, in this this is live. We are in since I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it is six forty five right now. Um, a lot of people are saying like, James, what are you? What's your GFR? Your latest one? 
I don't know. I haven't gone back to get it tested. But as soon as things at the hospitals kind of settle down and say, hey, come on back in, I will be in there. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't care what my GFR is. What I care about is how do I feel and do I have any symptoms? I have no symptoms. My energy is great. I feel even better than I did back in January. You know, so chances are my GFR is higher, but if not, I don't care because I'm looking at, you know, my quality of life. You know, am I stable? Am I able to do everything I want to do without being held back by my kidneys? That's what matters to me. Not a single little number that really, it doesn't tell you how healthy you are. It's just an estimation based on how much, how, how your, your kidneys are removing waste and, and, and toxins from your blood. And of course we want that number to go up higher, but you know, I don't live by that number. I live by how I feel, you know, and, and you know, no symptoms thanks to diet and lifestyle changes. All right, let's jump back into to, to, to keto real quick in case we've missed anything. Um, anything we did miss that you can think of? I know we talked about a lot of different things here and there's a lot of stuff going on in the chat. I'm going to try to catch up on that. I think uh, one thing that we didn't quite touch on yet, which is something that I'm sure a lot of people are wondering about is kidney stones. Oh, yes. And Right. So something that is a potential and some studies have shown it that a ketogenic diet may induce more kidney stones. And this is because of the foods that are promoted in that high fat diet. So, again, this is one of those situations where not everybody with kidney issues will have kidney stones or suffer from kidney stones. But if that's something that you have experienced, you have a history of your doctors warning you about, keep that in mind. If you are thinking about the ketogenic diet, because this can cause problems. And, uh, James, like you mentioned, your doctor said you have to wait a certain to a certain GFR before it would be okay. Because again, the ketogenic diet is not proven to be helpful related to kidney issues. And we've talked about this in our past videos, our past conversations about any kind of nutrition study, any kind of diet study requires everybody to be in a little bubble and to have no other situations occurring in the outside to get rid of all those other variables, which is just so hard to do. And that's why there's so little research on these specific things. When we talk about keto and kidneys and say kidney stones. It, it's very, very difficult to find, but some of what studies are showing is that because of the diet change, again, a ketogenic diet doesn't talk about the sodium content. That's not a focus for them. And a high salt diet can lead to more kidney stones. So that could be one of the reasons that it is maybe leading to more kidney stone issues for people. But again, it's case by case basis. What we know at this point is that it's not proving to show on the positive side that the keto is going to be preventive by any means for, um, for kidney stones. Yeah. And, and I've, I've had kidney stones in the past. And for those of you out there who have had them, I'm sorry. Uh, you definitely don't want, <laughs> don't want them. And, and matter of fact, I think next week, Jen and I are going to talk about kidney stones. Um, but when I did, um, have my last kidney stone probably about a year and a half ago after that my doctor said hey when you drink water you guys this isn't crystal clear there's lemon juice in here he said add lemon juice to your water gives it some flavor and it it can help with the kinds of kidney stones that i was developing mm -hmm. uh, but i kept an eye on that i was like if i feel anything that even remotely feels like a stone is forming, I was ready to stop that keto instantly because I did not want to go through that again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at some of the comments. We've got some really funny things in here. Uh, someone asked, <laughs> how old are you, James? How old do you guys think I am? Now, there's about a 30-second a delay between us talking and them seeing it. So I'm going to give them time to comment how old they think I am. Don't worry about offending me if you think I'm <laughs> older than I really am. But how old do you really think I am? Um, I like to think that I, I feel and look younger than I am. But, you know, my, my hair is really short and, 
you know, this, there's a little bit of a race here on the sides <laughs> going back. <laughs> All right, we got ages coming in. All right. Wow. <laughs> All right. People are being honest. We we do not have the number yet. I'm watching guesses come by. There was a, a 50, a 55, 44, 49, 46, 43, 48. All right, there we go. Claude, you got it. 48 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and just barely. Now, I was hoping all of you guys would guess late 30s. I like to think that I, I kind of still look late 30s. Um, <laughs> but oh, there we go. K. Murray, whoever that is, thank you with a guess of 38. <laughs> well, age is really just a number, honestly. Exactly. And, and as a matter of fact, um, I'm actually healthier today and have more energy than when I had kidney disease and just before my kidney disease. Um, I've said this sometimes in the past, not during our conversations, but my kidney disease, it actually, it saved my life. And people may think, what? How did kidney disease save your life? It kind of derailed it. No, 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 no. I was, you know, eating extremely unhealthy. I had no um, knowledge, really, of nutrition because we're not taught that in school. And, you know, I my heart was not doing good. My blood pressure, you know, I had it under control of pills, but I was taking lots of pills for my blood pressure. Uh, and I'm sure I was headed towards an early grave. But once I had to face... Um, an even earlier grave when I sat there and the doctor's like, look, your kidneys failed. Your GFR is eight. Uh, this isn't going to work. You, you, your life is, okay. is about to change completely. And I remember the doctor saying, I'm serious. Cause I'm always Mr. Positive. I was like, Oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll cut back on sodas. We'll be okay. Um, uh, so no, 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 this is serious. But then I, I learned about nutrition and how important it is. It's the, it's the building blocks for our body. It gives us the energy that we need to, to do things, even just to think for our brain. And now I'm so much healthier. I have a lot more energy. Uh, my blood pressure is not as bad, even though my kidneys failed. And I still have, everybody, the exact same kidneys. They did the, you know, the ultrasound. They were shrinking. They were shriveling. They were scarred up. Those are the exact same kidneys I have today in me. There's no fix in that. Um, I've just learned about nutrition. I'm living healthier. Um, you know, the things that we're talking about here and that has really saved my life and I've added years. I'm not headed to that early grave because of severe obesity and all the other problems that I was certain to get my, my blood sugar. I was only diagnosed as pre-diabetic, but that was when I was in the ICU because of the kidney failure um, on a very strict diet, I did not get blood tests to get tested for diabetes because I didn't want to be told I was diabetic. So I just avoided it. I was like, if I don't hear it, nah, 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 mm -hmm. it doesn't exist, which is not true. Um, mm -hmm. Now my A1C, much better, not even pre-diabetic. I'm good because of these diet and lifestyle changes. So I thought I'd just share that a little bit. Um, answer a few of the questions that people were, were uh, saying in there about uh, a number of things. Thank you. There's so many great comments. I can't even read them fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm really glad that we're able to help people and answer questions like this. I think this is uh, hopefully some good information. Yeah. So let me quickly go through here and see what questions people did ask related to kidney disease or keto diets. Is there anything we missed that you wanted to mention in our conversation about keto diet? Um, I think we've covered a lot of the pieces that we, um, that we should have discussed. Uh, I know that we have the blog article that mm -hmm. um, you can share in the notes so that people can go and check that out. If you have other questions, uh, you can also reach out to me and ask me questions. 
just so you know, because I do get people who ask me specific uh, for information regarding their labs, I am not legally allowed to decipher your labs. I'm not allowed to provide direct advice uh, without working one on one. So I just I do want to put that out there. I don't want you to think that uh, I'm able to tell you what to do if you have a creatinine of 2.7 or something. It, it's it's uh, it's something I help my clients with, but we you as you know that that's a piece of the puzzle. That is not the whole picture, and I need the whole picture to give uh, to give appropriate nutrition advice. So you can reach out and ask questions, like general questions, and I'll answer them as best as I can. Um, but you can also find more information on my website regarding the keto diet, regarding other, um, the blog art articles we talked about, like anemia, things like that as well. Let me see if I have your website here. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. And you got your, your six day meal plan. Now also people that you work one-on-one -on -one with, we do have some people who are international here. Do you want to mm -hmm. touch on that? Unfortunately, because of licensure laws, um, I am a registered licensed dietitian. I can help people in the United States. Unfortunately, I cannot work one on one with people internationally. Uh, I do have a group program that can work with international and I have worked with people internationally that way. At this point, the registration is closed. But I promise you all will be one of the first groups to know when that does open again, because I love helping people and really just getting rid of a lot of the misinformation out there and getting you on the right track to figuring out what's best for your kidneys. Yeah. Oh, and I know they're going to be excited. All right. So let's see what questions we have. Someone asked, how did you get your BP down, James? So I stay on my meds. I keep taking my meds. I started losing weight. I started exercising at least 30 minutes every single day. The doctor said 30 minutes, five days a week. I do it every single day. My favorite exercise, walking 10,000 steps a day at least. Um, I think my record was about 16,000 in a day. All of that with the same kidneys that put me in the hospital. Um, not letting it hold me back. So, you know, just eating healthier, watching what I eat, um, eating more heart friendly. That's, that's, that's what helped. Now I'm still on my blood pressure meds. I have been able to reduce the dosages that I take. Um, and I monitor my blood pressure every single day, every morning, every afternoon, every evening, sync it to the cloud, goes to my doctors. Matter of fact, let me remind you guys or let you guys know. Thursday, two nights from now, if you're watching this live at six o'clock Eastern time, the same time video about blood pressure control and monitoring. And I have special guests there, um, from withings, the BPM connects device I use. Uh, they're going to be there to answer some questions about blood pressure, uh, devices. If you have any questions, so make sure and watch that video. Let's see what other questions we have in here. A lot of people are asking about meal plans and you do have a free six day meal plan on your website. You mm -hmm. want to tell them how to get that real quick? Sure. Well, it's really easy. You go to my website, jenhernandezrd.com. And if you stick around on the website for just a couple seconds, I don't make it an annoying, like right away in your face pop up, but I have something that will prompt you. If you want to sign up, you join my email list. I am not good about sending a lot of emails, so you don't hear too much from me. <laughs> <laughs> but you do get the six-day meal plan, and it includes six days of plant-based recipes. And I've had a lot of great feedback from people about trying these new recipes. And each recipe actually has a breakdown of the protein, the sodium, the phosphorus, potassium content, so that you know exactly how it can fit into your diet. Because again, just like James said, it's all about portions. So I give you the recipes and the outlines of how they can fit into the day. And it's up to you to decide what that means for you and how that can be adjusted if it needs to be adjusted for your dietary needs. So get those recipes from my website because uh, they're really good. I think one of the best ones personally, I think is probably the chickpea salad. I think that one is, is really, really good and makes for an excellent go-to. super satisfying and high in fiber and uh, really easy. Ooh, I like high in fiber. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 
All right, so we have a question you may not want to answer, and you don't have to. It's from when we were doing the Guess My Age. They said, how old is Jen? And okay. and, and they did <laughs> guess. Look at this. Uh, we got a, a nice guess from Chris. Says, you look 20. Yay. Okay, okay. End the conversation. I'm good. That's good. <laughs> so, okay, I think when I first came on your show, James, I told you guys how I'm not good with dates. I legitimately had to Google how old am I. Oh, I've had to do that many times. <laughs> so according to Google, according to the calculator that I looked up, I am 33 years old. There you go. You look great. <laughs> yeah, well, I had <laughs> I had a time. Wow, it was a while ago. I was walking with a coworker. We were walking back from lunch, chatting, and for some reason... Uh, he mentioned how old he was. Uh, maybe it was because he had his first kid. And I remember he said 37. I said, 37? I thought you were younger than me. He says, I am. When are you born? And I told him, he says, you're you're almost 40. I said, what? And I had to go on. <laughs> I had to, to ask Siri how old I was when I gave her my birthday. And she told me. And I'm like, I was 39. I'm like, I lost track completely. I stopped counting. That happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's again, age is a number. And um, I feel like sometimes I act like I'm 50 and sometimes I act like I'm 12. And there's a big range in there, but it all depends on my attitude and uh, my mentality for the day. So according to today, because I had to look it up, I'm 33. There you go. Now, Now, what month is your birthday in? Did we miss it yet? No, it's in November. So. Oh, my, time. my wife's November, November 19th. Okay. I'll, I'll have my birthday before her. She's way out there. Yeah. Yes, my, my son just had his birthday this month, May 3rd. Woohoo! Oh, Turned seven. My husband's, birthday is, uh, my husband's birthday is on Thursday, so got to make ah. sure that we celebrate him quarantine style. <laughs> Tell him happy birthday. All right. We have another question. Jeff says, I started Rinadil this week and I'm going to the bathroom more. Is this normal? So if, uh, if you're peeing more, that has nothing to do with Rinadil. If it's something else, it could be Rinadil. It takes a little bit to get used to it and there can be a change there. Uh, I'm still taking my Rinadil every day. My two tablets, I take them in the morning when I get up. I actually don't take it with any food. It can be taken with or without food. They recommend with food so you don't have any uh, any gas. But you can get used to that after a couple weeks. You can take it without that. Let's see. I'm scrolling. I'm going to try to answer as many of these questions as we can. Oh, here's a good one. Um, any suggestions for someone who has never cooked and now has stage 3 kidney disease? What do you recommend for someone like that? Oh, um, I always tell people to just start practicing cooking. So, I mean, it, it is a skill. Cooking is a skill and it can be something as simple as throwing a few things together using a bag salad mix and some oil and vinegar and it can get more intricate, but you have to start practicing cooking. If you don't, if you, if you don't hone that skill, it's going to become more and more frustrating. You're going to feel more trapped you're probably going to be reaching for things that are more packaged or processed that are not going to be helping you, especially at stage three. I love, love working with people with stage three kidney disease because they have so many opportunities of different diet changes that can actually help preserve or reverse kidney function at that point because it's not so far gone that it's a riskier situation. So Uh, With stage three, you have plenty, plenty of opportunities to eat more good foods and take advantage of it. Talk with your doctor. If you don't know the best diet for yourself, if you don't know what's going to work for you the best, I really, really, really encourage you to find a dietitian. Ask your doctor for a referral. If your doctor doesn't know, because they don't always know we exist, you can call your health insurance provider, ask for a dietitian who is in your health insurance network, or you can just Google dietitian near me and it will pop up and and give you tons of places. Worst case scenario, I am a dietitian. Even if you don't want to work with me, I love connecting people to dietitians that they can help with. And that is very often times what I do for people. 
if they decide that we shouldn't be working together or if they want to find somebody in person because all of my services are virtual, I help connect them with a dietitian that is closer to them that I feel confident is going to give uh, the best protection for kidney disease possible. Because I do have a, I know a lot of dietitians in, in my traveling and living in different states and working dialysis. Uh, I, I have a large dietitian network and I love to support them so that they can support you. And, uh, so we can all be one big, happy kidney family. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you, so many doctors for some reason overlook referring kidney patients to a dietitian. Um, now of course I started kidney disease at the bottom and I'm trying to work my way up and get healthier. Um, but boy, even when I was, you know, going to the doctor just for being overweight, you know, they would say, you need to lose weight, go on a diet. They never told me about the advantages or the benefits right. of working with a dietitian and learning from someone. I kind of thought, oh, they're just going to go there and give me a textbook. Here's what you got to do. But a, a dietitian sits down. They talk to you. What do you like? When do you eat? What do you not like? Have you ever tried yogurt? Do you like fish? They ask all these mm -hmm. questions. And then they worked with me to create something that worked. So I love that. Now, as far as, as cooking goes, one tip I have I was an awful cook. First of all, I never cooked anything before my kidney disease. The only thing I did was reheat stuff, and it almost always was in the microwave. Um, I ate out every single meal. I mean, breakfast, lunch, dinner, out and about. You know, on the way to work, went through a drive through McDonald's, got lots of those little wraps the burrito wraps i get like four or five of them they're only a buck each you get five five dollars how bad can five dollars be for me well yeah that's how i justified the food was the cost of it so the dollar meal was my enemy um, or at least my health enemy um, but then when i learned to cook the first thing i learned to cook which i got really good at and i love cooking is stir fry yeah, because it's so easy to just get. You can even get it already chopped up and cleaned. The veggies, there's so much you can add to it. Throw in a few little nuts, some pecans or some almonds or something like that. Throw in some water chestnuts. Get a little crunch. It, it 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 it. You make it really fast. It's super easy to clean up. You're not scrubbing a whole bunch of dishes or anything like that. And then the sauce is what makes the flavor: ginger, garlic, you know, lemon, lime. So many things you can use to add flavor where you're still eating the same thing and you're getting a healthy meal that you cooked up so easy. Um, and it, 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 it is my go-to meal is stir fry. I love making stir fry. Matter of fact, today I was going to make stir fry for lunch, but I didn't have veggies. And I was like, oh, I didn't go to grocery shopping this weekend. Okay. I was like, no veggies and no apples? Yeah. I'm, I'm out because I was supposed to go grocery shopping on Sunday and I don't know why but I didn't do it. I'm just going every two weeks, which makes it really hard for fruits and veggies. Um, my wife goes out in between and gets stuff. But that is my go-to thing. I, I started out with stir fry. It's so hard to mess up. I mean, you just gotta burn the food. That's how you mess it up. Um, so look at, there's lots of videos on YouTube that can show you how to make stir fry. You can buy the, the stuff already done or get your broccoli your mm -hmm. cauliflower your carrots your snow peas whatever you want throw it in there get some sauces fantastic way to get started all right let me look through some more of these questions we got on here boy we got lots of comments this is fantastic someone asked oh this is i'm gonna let you answer this and i i have an answer is it better to eat fruit or drink it oh my um 100 eat so there much we better go. to eat fruit instead of drinking it. So, you know, if we think of just something like oranges, right? Oranges are a hot topic in the kidney world. And orange juice can be a big no-no or be careful because of the potassium content. But if you were just to have one or let's say two clementines or a tangerine mm -hmm. and still get that orange flavor, it's going to be significantly lower, safer in potassium for you. So it's not... Uh, it's not as risky and it's providing the fiber, which juice does not offer that fiber. It's not, uh, it's not part of the juice. So you're eliminating that fiber from the diet as well. 
I know people are worried about the sugars when it comes to the fruit juices. And yes, there are sugars. More, more often than not, it's still natural sugar, but it's, again, the quantity. How many oranges have to be juiced mm -hmm. to make a glass of orange juice? That's why the sugar content gets so high because it's so many pieces of fruit that are needed to make one serving. So I don't say entirely no to juices. I do say stick to about four ounces or half a cup as a serving. And be careful with potassium if that's something that you need to watch out for. Uh, otherwise, the more fruit that you eat, the more nutrition you're also getting like that fiber, which I think is really, really important. Yeah, and, and I used to love orange juice back in the day. And I could drink probably 24 ounces in a meal with, you know, without really thinking about it um, at breakfast. How many oranges is that? That's a lot of oranges. You don't get much juice out of them. Um, no, I find it much more enjoyable to eat the orange. Um, mm -hmm. and it's easy to, to manage the portion where when you're going with drinking stuff, you're like, ah, oh, I, I can eat a, I can eat an orange or I can get this much juice. Right. That, that and much juice ain't going to work for me. No, much. no. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, there's a whole other, the, the whole other idea of like smoothies, right? I mean, that's another mm -hmm. way of drinking fruit. Still, portion size comes into play. When you're making a smoothie, use a, an almond milk, a plant milk, or water kind of base, and then add a cup of frozen berries, which are low in potassium. Add some spinach if you want to do some greens in there or something. Um, but again, it's still portion size, and people, I see people do like huge smoothies, like, like my water cup here, like a big smoothie size, and that's a lot to take in at one point in time. And even if you do a little potassium here, a little potassium here, if you're having that much, that can still add up to be a lot and can be a lot for the kidneys and for the body to work with at one point in time. So bottom line, portion still matters. Yep. All right. We have a question here. Sardines in a can versus fish oil supplements. We actually talked about we'd rather have the real thing than pills. But this is one area where I definitely lean more towards the pill. <laughs> yeah, this is a very personal uh, choice. So my question would be, number one, do you like sardines in a can? Is that something that you do want to have? Or do you feel obligated to have it for some nutritional dietary reason? If you feel obligated, but you don't like them, then I don't think it's necessarily something that you need to keep in your diet. If you like them and want to keep them, then that can be fine. Something that I think is important for us, especially in the kidney world to think of as well, sardines, when you're eating them, they're, you eat the whole thing, right? So you're also eating the bone of the fish. What is stored in our bones, in, in bones in general? Calcium. And? Vitamin D. Phosphorus. I'm guessing. Okay, phosphorus. Ah, I should yeah. have known that one. I don't eat sardines and I don't eat bones. Right. Right. So if you have problems with calcium phosphorus, that would be something to just kind of keep in the back of your mind of uh, if that happens to be careful with that, or at least to tell your doctor or your dietitian, ideally, that that's what you're eating because that could be influencing your lab results. So while I do think they can have a place in your diet, it's going to depend, again, on your labs. It's going to depend on your preferences. And if it doesn't fall into place for that, then you can do a fish oil supplement. I mean, there's a lot of benefits. We've talked about pro-renal that has fish oil in it already as a renal vitamin with that included fish oil. So that is an option to do that kind of supplement without having excess. But I do oftentimes recommend fish oil supplements to my clients to help with that anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory property. Very good. And I know we're getting, we're, we're about almost 15 minutes past our hour. Um, mm. There are a number of questions about, can I eat eggs? Which I'll tell you guys, that is my go-to travel breakfast. When I am on the road, if I don't have what I need, I can always find two eggs and scramble them or get two eggs scrambled. And personally, that is my go-to breakfast. And I find that eggs just keep me full uh, for quite a while until I can get to the food that I want to eat. So what are your thoughts on eggs? And maybe, you know, is it okay to, what do you think about the whole egg? Or are you just an egg white person? Um, well, I think I'm going to, I'm going to kind of refer again to the whole um, 
ideal uh, method that I use for my clients, which is plant-based. So I don't recommend eggs to start for my clients. Uh, that is a plant, or I'm sorry, that is an animal protein. On a large egg will have about six grams of protein, and that's the whole egg. So it's still protein, animal protein that the kidneys will be taking care of, that the body will be managing and, and figuring out. There is good nutrition in a whole egg because the yolk has a lot of nutrients in there. The B vitamins, choline, I, there's a, a lot of great things in the egg yolk. It also has phosphorus in it. So phosphorus from animal sources are absorbed a little bit more than plant-based sources. Something to consider. I... I can't say yes or no, because this is, again, one of those, it's a personal preference and what are your, your goals for your kidney health? I think that if you do choose eggs, you need to be careful with how many you have because that protein can add up quite fast. And if you have kidney issues, you might need to be limiting your protein. So keep that in mind. Uh, I remember in dialysis, when I worked in there, I was a, a bigger fan of the egg whites only because mm -hmm. egg whites don't have any phosphorus in them, but it's a source of high protein. So oftentimes for dialysis, if, if you are already on dialysis, then maybe egg whites would be a really good protein option for you without risking having a higher phosphorus. Very good. All right, here's a question that um, I, I have an answer for. Nelson asked, can we live with GFR 30% forever? So if you're, so first of all, GFR is not a percent. That's probably the most common thing that I see people say. Um, a GFR of 30, GFR is a scale of 0 to 120. So a GFR of 30, um, it's close to 30%. Uh, if you're holding at a GFR of 30, you can live forever. As a matter of fact, most people with a GFR of 20 to 30 can manage their symptoms and live a perfectly, you know, normal life where you've got energy, you're doing things, you might get a little tired easier. You know, you've got to work on your diet and stuff. Uh, but a GFR number of a certain value doesn't really mean much. Now, if it's really low, it may mean you, you've you got to get ready for dialysis. If you're sitting there with a GFR of, of nine or 10, uh, that's extremely low because then your, your, your kidney function is like six, 7%. You know, that's, that's not much there. But when, when looking at, can I live with this GFR, it really comes down to the symptoms and, and where is it going? You got to look at a trend. Is your GFR going down? Is it going down rapidly? Um, those are things you got to work with your doctor and talk to them about. But if you're stable at 30, you're holding there, hey, keep eating healthy, avoid things that are going to cause damage. Keep getting checkups to watch and keep an eye on it in case it does start to go down. A GFR, you can't look at me and say, James, I can tell in your eyes you're a GFR 30. You, you can't tell. Um, when you see me outside and I'm jogging, I, I physically, I'm jogging, not like huffing and puffing. I'm out there jogging. I, I think I look a lot younger than I am. And you, you people, you know, some of my neighbors, they said, you got the kidney problems, right? I'm like, yeah, I still got those same bad kidneys that put me in the hospital. And they're just shocked. And, and they asked, like, you know, what did you do to heal them? I did not heal them. There is nothing that can heal your kidneys. That was a couple other questions we saw in here that they heard something can cure their kidneys. There is nothing to cure your kidneys. There's nothing to repair your kidneys. There's nothing to rebuild your kidneys. Um, what there are, are choices you can make and hopefully you can reduce the burden on your kidneys so that you can stabilize and reduce or eliminate symptoms. Uh, that's what you can do. Now, if you, if you're not able to do that and not everyone can, you may have underlying cause that, you know, there's, there's, there's a reason why your kidneys are declining. Um, it may get to the point where you need dialysis and dialysis is not a bad thing. It's what keeps you alive. And then you can get on a transplant list. And, and I feel very positive that in the future, you know, seven, 10 years from now, possibly, we may see alternative treatments to dialysis. I've talked to some of the companies that are working on things and there may be other things. So I look at it as, you know, my kidneys right now are, are you know, I'm, I'm stable, you know, I have no symptoms. I love it where I'm at. I feel great. They don't bother me at all. 
and I'm buying myself time by living healthier. And I buy myself time in two ways. One, I changed my life. I'm not headed to an early grave like I was before with, you know, my bad eating habits and stuff. And then I'm buying time that, hey, one day if my kidneys do start to decline for one reason or another and I can't stop it, maybe I've bought time to where there's an alternative to dialysis. And if if need be, there's always dialysis. And I would make the best of it. You guys know me. I'll make the best of whatever I got. So hopefully that kind of answers. I know it's a long answer to that question. Can you live with the GFR 30? Um let me see what else we have in here real quick. I don't want to keep Jen too long because it is getting late. And I know my kids are going to be begging me, Daddy, we want to play games. They love board games <laughs> every single night. That's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've brought board games back to life. All right. Yeah. Well, I know there, well, it's a good time to do it. there are tons and tons of comments, so many things. Um uh, Let's see. I'm going to do one last question. Let's see. Um, <laughs> okay. Someone asked about doctors saying kidneys cannot be regenerated. Well, we kind of just touched on that. It, it can't. If you see anything to buy that says it can regenerate, can flush, can rebuild, you just throwing your money away. And mm-hmm. you may even be taking something that's going to hurt yourself and hurt your mm-hmm. kidneys. Um, all right. All right, here's what I'm going to let you answer from Professor R. He's, he's asked this question a couple times. I've, I've seen it pop up. So we're going to, I'm going to let you answer this one. It's kind of a, it's about a person vomiting, having other issues. Um, are you able to tell about how much nutrition is lost when they're doing this? Is there really a, a number? <laughs> The only thing I would say in my experience would be lab checks. And if it's happening very often for you, that is a sign that there is something going on because vomiting and diarrhea are symptoms of something else happening and you need to seek medical attention. Like that's just the bottom line because they need to figure out what's causing that. The nausea, vomiting, diarrhea is the symptom. Okay. It is Mm -hmm. not what's wrong. What's wrong needs to be figured out. And so if it happens a lot, yes, it can lead to nutritional deficiencies. Not all the time. It's not something that you should be self-medicating for or taking a lot of uh, supplements of any kind, vitamins of any kind, thinking that you're going to need to replace them, especially when you have kidney issues. If um, a person with a healthy, fully functioning kidneys goes through a bout of nausea or diarrhea, their kidneys are going to help rebalance everything and hold back and and make sure that everything is kind of taken care of again. And people could drink a, a sports drink or something. They could have Pedialyte or whatever to replenish some of those nutrients. But with kidney issues, it's a much riskier thing to do because you could end up giving yourself too much of something and that causes even more problems. So yeah, and- this is, oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Well, I was going to say, Do not ignore any symptoms you may be having or anything that's Mm -hmm. new. Mention it to your doctor. I made that mistake. I I did not like going to the doctor. I just like, ah, they're just going to tell me to lose weight. Um, And it's my own fault. Um, I ignored so many symptoms. And it got to the point where I went to my my, uh, family doctor and he said something's wrong you need labs you need blood work we need to we need to see what's going on and i remember telling him oh, okay well i got some errands to run i'll go later and he said no you you're going now or i'm calling an ambulance and mm-hmm. we're taking you we're going to go to an er you need labs which one do you want to go to i'm going to call and have everything ready and i drove to the closest er um I had so many symptoms I had overlooked or I ignored. I thought I had to go away. Vomiting was one of those. And uh, I couldn't keep anything down for almost two weeks, even water, drinking water. It, mm-hmm. it didn't want to stay down. And when I got to that, the, the ER, I remember I parked my car, I opened the door, and then I just collapsed right there mm-hmm. in the parking lot. Um, I was in and out of consciousness. I remember the people running over to me and people talking to me, then then I was somehow in a wheelchair. I don't know how I got in the wheelchair. Um, I remember going through a parking lot. 
Uh, I remember then I'm on a gurney. Um, you know, again, and then I just kept, like, I couldn't stay awake. I kept falling asleep, but it was just loss of consciousness because I waited too long and I ignored symptoms. So if you have symptoms, don't ignore them. Mention them to your doctor. Give your doctor a call. Ring them up. Let them know, um, hey, this is happening. And, you know, like, like Jen said, what you're seeing is a result of something. It's not the problem. If you have, if you're vomiting a lot, vomiting is not the problem. It's because of something and you need, you need to find that. Uh, there was one more question I wanted to do. It was a really simple one. It's a kind of a basic kidney one. So it means we got somebody new here. They're asking what is GFR? GFR stands for glomerular filtration rate and boy it took me a long time to be able to to let that roll off my tongue um that is an estimate most of the time it has a little e in front of it e gfr and it's an estimate used to figure out how well your kidneys are removing waste products and certain toxins from your blood and it's how much they can remove in a certain amount of time and that number helps create a scale uh, that determines what stage of kidney disease you are in. Stage one, you've got just a little bit, and it moves down to three. Now, three sometimes is 3A and 3B, it's two stages that were joined together. Stage three, kind of in the middle. Stage four, things are getting pretty serious. And stage five is also known as renal failure or end stage renal failure. That's where you've lost the majority or vast majority of your kidney function. That's a GFR of 14 or lower, which when you do the math, that ends up being about 12% or less of your kidney function because a GFR isn't exactly a one-to-one to your percentage scale. Now, as you get older, your kidneys kind of start to wear out and your GFR naturally gets lower. So a person who is... 85 years old and has a GFR of 62, um, that's not something that doctors are going to be worried about. They're like, yeah, you're, they've, you know, as you've aged, your GFR has gone down. And most of the time when we are comparing a GFR, that is to a healthy person. There is, a, there is kind of a normal GFR for each age range, and it's good to find out what that is and compare yours to that. So hopefully that kind of helped answer what a GFR is or what is GFR. Um, it's a number that a lot of people put a lot of value in. It's nice to know what your GFR is. For me personally, I want to know my labs. Um, what is my red blood cell count? My hemo- I look at my labs. What is out of the range? What am I too high on? What am I too low on? I got to fix those. Let me get in the standard range. And then when everything's the standard range, what I got to do to get right in the middle so that I have a buffer to go up and down. That's what I focus on. If your labs, you know, your red blood cells, your hemoglobins, those are within the range, you're you're not going to uh, be at risk of, you know, like the severe anemia, which just zaps all your energy out of you. But a GFR of 19 doesn't tell me if you have anemia or if you're suffering from it. Um, so I personally do not put too much um, value in the GFR. I like to know what it is. It tells me, you know, a ballpark of where I am, but it doesn't tell me what to do. Um, GFR of 29 is stage four. GFR of 30 is stage three. Um, you can't tell me that a person GFR 29 does something different than a GFR 30. But if you show me your labs or your doctor looks at your labs and you see your potassium is too high, they can tell you what to do. So that's kind of, that's kind of, uh, hopefully that helped answer your, your, uh, um, your question. I'm going to try to pronounce your name. Critty Kitty. (laughs) I think that's her name. Um, about what is GFR? All right, everybody, we have been here for an hour and a half. Boy, time has flown. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We will be back here next Tuesday. Share the links. Tell your friends. This is free tips and advice. I'm a kidney patient. Jen is a renal dietitian, which is even better than a dietitian because she specializes 
in helping people with kidney disease. Make sure, if you have not done so, go follow her Facebook group. Um, lots of great information in there. And knowledge is the key for us kicking kidney disease to the curb and living a great life without kidney disease holding us back. Um, oh, I see a, a few people asking about one-on-one -on -one calls. Um, that is something to reach out to Jen if you'd like to work with her one-on-one. -on -one. I'm just a kidney patient. I can't work one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the best I could do is say, hey, here's some questions to ask your doctor about. And I'm always going to tell everyone, work with a dietitian. Get your renal dietitian and work with them. Uh, that's kind of <laughs> like my, my big flag. Work with one. And I ask everybody, are you working with a renal dietitian? Um, <laughs> let's see, what else is there? Okay, so this Thursday, we I'm doing a video about the importance of managing and monitoring, a little tongue twister there, managing and monitoring your blood pressure. Now, I've talked so much about diet and the things that you eat, and that's because we control those. We get to pick what we eat, and it, it's the building blocks for our body, the energy, the stuff that it uses. Uh, but managing your blood pressure is extremely important. Remember, that's the number two cause of new cases of kidney disease. Your blood pressure has to be in the right, right range. Too low, it's not filtering properly. And too high, you can cause irreversible damage that you cannot repair. So we're going to talk about that. So make sure you check that one out. It's really important. We're going to have a live chat during that too. So uh, you can ask questions and things like that that are related to blood pressure. We're going to have some guests there that can also talk about equipment and monitoring your blood pressure. Anything I missed, Jen, that you want to mention? Um, I guess the only other thing that I haven't even mentioned is, uh, if you're not on Facebook or if you don't want to be on a Facebook group, but you want information, you can also follow me on Instagram and I am on Instagram and that's again, free information that you can see and it's plant.powered.kidneys. So you can find me on Instagram, follow me there. I will tell you, um, I have a really fun post for tomorrow of a recipe. So, <gasps> yeah. oh. and it's something that we've talked about before, James. So I think, uh, I think it's going to be a really, really good one. And I'm excited to share it. Oh, I love recipes. I cannot <laughs> get enough of them. And I love videos of people making recipes because then I get to watch them make it. And I'm, I, you know, we had the question earlier about learning how to, to cook or how to get started. I, di I didn't know how to cut things and I would watch people like, oh, that's what they do. And boy, mm -hmm. it, it changed my world with how I prepare now my meals because I saw people actually cutting things and doing this. And there's these little tips that they do and how they're putting food in there. And are they sh constantly mixing it up or what? Oh, they're putting a lid on it. Why? You know, yeah. I pick all those up. So I love videos, especially too, with um, uh, cooking things. Oh, hey, we have someone from Germany. Hey, I used to live in Ramstein. Boom. Back in the mm. early 80s. My dad was Air Force. Ramstein brat here. Woohoo. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I think that is everything. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's great having everyone here. And as you can see, it is live. And I know we didn't mm -hmm. get to everybody's questions, but we got as many, uh, we got to many of them as we, you know, we can. Um, I actually go through all these after the show and I might ask Jen, hey, do we have this, have that? Come back, check the video, look in the comments. You'll find links there. There's links to the things we've talked about so far today that are in there, including a blog that Jen wrote about keto diet. So if you want to learn even yeah. more about it, the link is already there in the description. You guys can go through to it. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. And we will see you in the next video. Bye, everyone. <laughs>